UndraftedFreeAgent.com. I'm Chris McKee. Episode one of the season 2020-21 NCAA basketball season. I'm covering all things mid-majors throughout the season. I'm going to do a pod once a week, so hopefully you'll tune in on the regular. Some of the topics we're going to get into today, just to start. Gonzaga, number one team in the country. Yes, they are a mid-major. Some of their key additions, key losses, what to expect from the Zags this year. Rick Patino back in college basketball, coaching at Iona. So me, Iona now must watch as far as mid-major. Uh, Stephen F. Austin, where do they go this year uh, after their magical 28-3 run, excuse me, last year. Uh, San Diego State, 30-2, and two, uh, you know, obviously kind of had them and Stephen F. Austin, a bit of their destiny ripped away from them with the NCAA basketball season or tournament being canceled so we'll chat a little bit about that but first things first the elephant in the room Rick Pitino back in college basketball for the first time since 2017 when he was unceremoniously asked to depart Louisville after an FBI scandal which involved payment of players providing sex for recruits and uh, I believe their parents or uncles you know some of the dads and stuff like that um, and now he's back, Rick obviously coaching in Greece, now back in the Metro Atlantic Conference. Quickly, name three teams in the MAAC this year. I can name them, but we'll get into that throughout the season. But So he's going to come in at Iona, takes over a team that was 12-17 and 17 last year. And, you know, obviously, Patino, two national championships under his belt in 96, as coaching that magical Kentucky team, and then 2013 with Louisville. Seven Final Four appearances, and, of course, the biggest of them all, a Greek Cup win in 2019. He was over-coaching in Greece. He actually did a great job. Uh, so I'm happy to see Rick back. I got some comments from some other coaches in the MAAC who I've spoke to throughout the offseason and, and their thoughts on, on him coming in now. Here's the deal with Patino. Whether you like him or not, the things he was accused of or whatever, I don't even know, found guilty of, whatever, at Louisville, this is anything that any number of you know top 25 programs are still doing to this day. He just got caught for it. So I'm not going to sit here up on some high horse and say, oh, he shouldn't be allowed back in college basketball and this. I'm happy to see him back. And based on some of the you know, the conversations I've had with other coaches in the same conference he's going to be coaching, they're happy to see him back. So we'll, we'll get a little bit into that. So one of the things that's interesting about the MAAC schedule this year and Iona, so what they're going to do, you know, obviously safety. So they're going to play a lot of back-to-back. So, for example, Iona December 11th and 12th against Monmouth. Then December 18th, 19th against Ryder back-to-back. January 1 and 2, Niagara. You you get the the sort of gist of that. And so uh, that's going to be cool to see. I mean, obviously, look, I'm happy these guys are just playing basketball. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen with Iona. They got, just looking at their schedule, they got a bunch of ESPN 3 games. So not going to be hard to find them this year. Some of the teams to be on the lookout as far as who are going to give them a run for their money is Siena, the Siena Saints, last year, 20-10. Under coach Carmen Messiarello, spoke to him over the offseason. He's got a loaded team coming back. Um, so they're going to be at the top of the heat. Don't just think just because Patina's at Iona, it's going to come in. It's going to be a cakewalk, and we'll see him in March or April or whenever the heck this NCAA tournament is going to be. There are teams there, and good quality teams. You know, We, we all know about Monmouth's magical runs to the NCAA, uh, NCAA tournament a couple of years with the bench mob and all that. But uh, a couple, couple pretty, decent, pretty decent teams, St. Peter's, coached by, coached by uh, Shaheen Holloway, the former Seton Hall legend. Um, and so I asked them this summer, we can check in on some of that audio right now. First, Siena coach Carmen Maciarello, and then second, you'll hear Shaheen Holloway's thoughts on what it means having Rick Pitino in conference coaching. So coming up this year, you're going to have an 800-pound gorilla in the same conference as you and Rick Pitino um, over at Iona. Thoughts on, you know, having a guy with that kind of resume now as a rival? Oh, man, I, I, you know, it's great for college basketball. It's great for the league. He's a Hall of Famer. And, um, you know, hopefully it just it brings out the best in everybody in the league. And, you know, hopefully, you know, it'll do a good thing for our notoriety, right? He has such a great reputation and, uh, you know, has done so much for the game of college basketball. It's just exciting. You know, somebody as a, as a kid, you know, you're watching, you know, coach Kentucky and coach Louisville and, you know, obviously he was in the NBA as well. And, uh, you know, his reputation speaks for himself. You know, it's, it's great for the league. You know, it's great for the league to have a coach like coach P in the league. You know, he's a hall of famer. 
you know, he's he's a godfather of college basketball. He does so many great things. You know, I had to, you know, I'm very fortunate to have known him before this. I'm not happy I got to play against him twice, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, for having him in the league is great. It's, I think it's great for the league. It gives us notoriety. You know, it gives us stability. You know, it gives us, you know, that thing that this league's been looking for. So you hear there's a general excitement even from those guys getting the opportunity to coach against them. I, I think it puts more eyes on the Metro Atlantic, and I think for the for the whole of it, it, it is a good thing. Now, one of the things I, I, you know, for me, I love Patino because one of the reasons I started watching college basketball going back to 1987 with that magical Providence team. So I grew up obviously in Canada in the Toronto area, and we went down to Providence, Rhode Island to stay uh, for the week for a hockey tournament. Got to play at Brown University, a bunch of other places. But uh, the family we stayed with took me to go watch the Providence Friars play hockey. And I fell in love with the atmosphere, loved it. It was just the greatest thing. I didn't know much about NCAA sports coming from Canada, and it was a great environment. And then we go down there and watch it, and I come back home, and a couple weeks later, I turn on the TV, and I see this little, I played high school for my team, this, this little white guy who's a point guard who kind of reminded me as a player. Billy Donovan was the Providence point guard. Obviously, now Billy's going to be the Chicago Bulls head coach coming out this year, was the head coach for OKC. But Rick Pitino, the young, uh, flashy coach for Providence who helped lead them to the Final Four. And, you know, instantly I connected with that team and with that program. So I've followed Rick's career you know, his entire career and really enjoyed him and supported him regardless of, you know, some of this nonsense that's going on. I just think there's worse things that's happened in college basketball and they're still happening. He said he just got caught. So I'm happy to see Patino back. I own a basketball. Their first game we've got coming up would be December 3rd against Merrimack. Tune in and we'll keep you up to date on uh, all things I own this year. They got some decent players coming in as well. <clears throat> so second thing I wanted to touch on is Gonzaga, number one team in the nation as far as the AP poll. Uh, you know, they're returning some key guys, but they lose three of their top four scores. Uh, the only out of the top four that's coming, Corey Kispert, <clears throat> excuse me, 13.9 points per game, but obviously they lose uh, Killian Tilly to the NBA, second round pick of the Memphis Grizzlies, and a couple other key guys. And so, you know, for me, them being ranked number one, I, I mean, look, Gonzaga is a damn good team. One of the key issues is they got the Florida transfer, Andrew Nemhart, good Canadian boy. Um, is he going to be eligible? We don't know yet. I haven't heard anything about a waiver as far as, you know, when I'm recording this tonight, just a couple of days before the start of the season, he is not eligible. That doesn't mean they're not still continuing to seek waivers. They're handing out waivers like popsicles so you may see them hard this year i think andrew is a future nba player i've seen him up close playing with the canadian u18 national team i've covered him up close interviewed him and also with the senior men's national team and i watched him play you know with team canada Corey joseph obviously at the time was with the indiana pacers nba player former toronto raptor former university of texas star and of course damn good players pretty good you know nba guard and when Corey came out of the game and Nemhart got into the game, I thought the offense moved a little better. He's very creative. He reminds me a little bit of Jason Kidd. You know, he's got those 30-yard passes. No, no pass is kind of out of his range. And so, I mean, if Andrew Nemhart is eligible, watch out for Gonzaga. But if not moving ahead, keep an eye on, on that. Now, some of the teams, I think they're going to have a shot. Like them just even winning the, the West Coast Conference, not a given. Some damn good teams in there. BYU. I mean, BYU, BYU is going to give you a game. They got men. We, we know that. Uh, St. Mary's every year. Randy Bennett's going to get guys. He's going to pull out the Australian Player of the Year and, and bring him into his campus. And, uh, you know, they're going to give them a run as well. Uh, Pacific, led by Damon Stoudemire, another Toronto connection, former Toronto Raptor, now the head coach, doing a great job down at Pacific. And, of course, Santa Clara, uh, pretty good team. You know, they return. Yasef Rancic, this guy's, you know, all-conference all player. They got a pretty deep roster coming in, some good new recruits, a bunch of Canadians, which I always support. Santa Clara, I had the chance to speak with Herb Sendek uh, throughout the offseason. I'll post some of that audio in, in one of the up, upcoming podcasts. But it's not a given that Gonzaga is even just going to cakewalk through the West Coast Conference, and we'll see them in the NCAA tournament. So that number one ranking is... I'd be shocked if they're anywhere near that near the end of the season. Just their opening games. I believe they open with Kansas 
uh, next week, and then Tennessee. I mean, right out the gate, that's two tough matches. Don't be surprised if they're 0-2 after that. Don't be surprised if they're 2-0 as well, but um, never never underestimate Mark Few and what he's got going on there. But um, a lot of uh, <clears throat> uncertainty surrounding Gonzaga. They show one guy that I'm really excited about. They have this freshman, Jalen Suggs, McDonald's All-American, just the second McDonald's All-American ever to play at Gonzaga. But in, in the state of Minnesota, this guy's Mr. Basketball and Mr. Football. So this this dude's some kind of athlete. He's about 6'4". He's a guard. So that's Jalen Suggs. That's one guy to, to keep an eye out for with Gonzaga as we move ahead throughout the season. Now, some of the other storylines affecting big majors. Um, University of Tennessee Martin head coach Anthony Stewart passed away last week at the age of 50. So I believe his son Parker, uh, leading scorer on the team. So, you know, thoughts and prayers to, to his family and everyone surrounding the UT Martin situation. That's, uh, you know, horrifying to hear just age 50. So um, hopefully, you know, maybe, maybe that kind of helps rally that team and they can put together a, a magical season in Coach Stewart's honor. Now, a couple of the teams I want to keep an eye on this year is, you know, where do these teams go now that they've lost NBA guys like Dayton? Dayton's a mid-major in the 8-10. They lose Obi Toppin. Now what for Dayton? So, I mean, they went 29-2 this past season. And so, I mean, it's going to be a challenge for their head coach, Anthony Grant, to kind of replicate that. So that's one of the teams that, you know, I said had their destiny ripped from them. They were going to, they were going to make a deep run in the, in the March Madness, and that's gone. NBA guy gone. So what now for Dayton? Keep a look on that. Same goes for San Diego State, 30-2. Uh, Brian Dutcher has done a great job, you know, keeping that program intact after Steve Fisher left. But they lose Malachi Flynn, drafted by the Toronto Raptors in the first round, which I'm very happy to see that they got him in. But uh, they lose some pretty key guys, and what's next for them? Also, Stephen F. Austin, 28-3 last year. We all remember that magical win against Duke. Nathan Bain, the buzzer beater with 0.1 seconds left on the clock, and First team to go into to Cameron and, and un, unseat Duke as a number one seed. And I don't know, God knows how long, but what a magical season they've had. And now the good news for them, they've returned some key starters. Cameron Johnson at guard and Roti Ware. It's, it's, it's a great name. but uh, So they're, they're going to be in the mix again. But one of the things I worry about them is kind of that hangover from such a magical season last year. You know, when, when you kind of achieve that, now Stephen F. Austin went from, you know, they're always in the March Madness tournament every couple of years. We get to see them, but I think they were pressed into national sort of uh, significance with that win against Duke. I see Nathan Bain and his story. Uh, he's on CNN, and then all of a sudden there's a spotlight on them, and now they go back to just playing Southland basketball and kind of a little bit of anonymity. So will their guys get up for it and can they kind of regroup it and get back there? So throughout the offseason, I spoke to head coach Kyle Keller a number of times. I've spoke to him. Great guy. Really enjoyed my conversations with him. But this is what he had to say about getting over that crash of the spotlight and trying to refocusing and, and getting back to work. You and I have talked about this before. You know, I, I was a music agent for 20 years for like Grammy winning bands. And then I would go on tour with the bands for a couple months. And then I'd come home and get back to regular life. And they'd be still on the road as rock stars. And I always had like a little bit of a crash, a little bit of a come down from, you know, I'm, I'm not being treated like a rock star anymore. Was there any bit of that with, with your team? You know, I'm turning on, I'm seeing CNN. I see Stephen F. Austin. I'm, you know, Jim Rome, Colin Cowherd, all these guys talking about you. And then it's kind of a little bit back to reality. Was there any crash after? that i know for me at least i mean uh, my wife's still making me do my laundry and stuff like that i wasn't getting special <laughs> treatment at home um but you know I, I think the thing for us you know chris is that um you know the day after we played you know we had this schedule but our kids are are you know feeding the homeless here for thanksgiving so you know we try to treat our guys and they they handled it great just like they've always been and obviously there's a lot of tension 
scene, everybody in our program kind of exhaled, like, whew. All right, now let's go back to playing. And that was a good lesson for us, I think, losing that game in Alabama. And we're almost eight hours from Alabama, and we took a bus over there instead of flying, which a lot of times we might fly. But it was just, a, I think these kids really enjoyed being around each other. And it was just a, a fun trip, and it was a long bus flight home. I think our guys were like, man, we don't want to go through this again. And so it was a pretty humbling experience for us. And, and and they've been really gritty, and they're not pretty. They're gritty, not pretty. And that's kind of what our team has kind of, kind of been all year long. A couple of the storylines of note I want to uh, keep an eye on throughout the season. Alabama State, a lot of eyes being po pointed towards the HBCU. So Alabama State down in the SWAC. I'm definitely going to keep uh, an eye on all things SWAC, all things HBCU. So Mo Williams, obviously, NBA vet, uh, part of the Cleveland Cavaliers NBA championship squad a couple of years ago. So he's now become the head coach at Alabama State. What can he do to help revive that team? They went 824 last year, so he's got to pick them up the scrap heap. I think that's one team to keep an eye on in the SWAC over the next little bit. Uh, Ball State, another team I like. I spoke to their head coach, James Whitford. Again, another coach I spoke to over the offseason. I mean, they've got some really good players. 18 and 13 last year, won a share of the MAC, and they returned a bunch of guys. Number one guy that to look out for, Ishmael El Amin. He originally put his name in the transfer portal, seeking better opportunities, and then within about two weeks just said, you know what, I'm going to come back, and that's huge news for Ball State. Obviously, Ishmael, the son of Khalid El Amin, the former UConn star, is another guy back in, back in my day, loved watching him. So uh, Ball State, a team in the MAC to keep an eye on. Siena, uh, I mentioned them earlier, another team in the w, uh, the MAAC, the Metro Athletic, that's going to give Iona a run. Vermont, they returned Steph Smith. Steph, Steph Smith, um, first team all-conference in the American East. The guy to Ajax, Ontario. Tested the NBA draft waters, opted to, uh, opted to come back, which I think was the right move. So they got a pretty loaded roster and a team that's going to do some things. 26-7 and seven last year, and uh, that's a team that's going to be in the mix for March Madness. And then one of the disappointments of the offseason, and I don't want to sit and talk about cancellations and COVID tests. I'm just, it just doesn't interest me, but no Ivy League basketball this year, which kind of BS. Uh, so no Harvard, no Princeton, no Yale, none of those rivalries. A lot of great teams, and you know those teams always in the mix come March Madness. So... I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe someone sees it. Maybe they'll do what they did with college football where, you know, a lot of teams like, you know, conference like the Big Ten, we're not playing. And then they turn on the TV and see South Alabama and Central Arkansas playing, getting TV time on ESPN. And then schools around the Big Ten saying, what the hell are we doing? Why are we not playing? So I'm hoping Ivy League maybe has a change of opinion at some point. But for now, not going to happen. So thanks for joining us. Episode one on the mid-major basketball podcast. I'm Chris McKee. Of course, don't forget to check out undraftedfreeagent.com. Subscribe. We're trying to build up the socials. You drop me a line on Twitter, but check us out on undrafted free agent on Instagram, Twitter, trying to build it up throughout the year. And we'll, we'll keep pumping mid-major content.